Am I connected? I think so. Judy, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Lonnie and I first would like to just thank the Canal Garden Club for um, Judy for calling us and asking us and the Garden Club for sponsoring and the Clay Center for making this wonderful venue um, available. So I'll talk first, I'm going to talk a, uh, about the science of climate change and then we'll switch over. Uh, the photographs that you've been enjoying here show some of the places where Lonnie and I have gone over the years to collect ice cores. The title of our talk is Climate Change, The Evidence, People, and Our Options. So the key points of my part of the presentation are that the Earth's climate is changing, the world is warming, and there's no doubt about this. Weather and climate are very different, and we'll discuss that. Global climate change involves many changes. It's not just about temperature. I know you hear the term global warming, but a much better term is global climate change because there's so many parts of our climate system that are changing. Changes in precipitation, sea level, glaciers, and ecosystems. And we'll talk about the fact that human activities that release carbon dioxide other greenhouse gases, as well as aerosols, which are particles, into the Earth's atmosphere, are the dominant cause of warming of our planet in, over the last 50 years. So, the Earth is warming, and so we have to look at the data. What we have are, is the globally average temperature of our planet from 1880 up to 2013. And we see the annual differences, that's the black line, and the five-year mean is the red line. And um, the point here is that you see a lot of variability, but there is an upward trend. The Earth is warming. These are the, the collection of global records. 2005 and 2010 were the warmest years on record since record keeping began and they are statistically indistinguishable. And the Earth has warmed since 1900, in other words, over the 20th century till now, three quarters of a degree centigrade, or about 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. But if we look at how this is distributed across the planet, you can see that there are areas that are warming much more strongly than other areas. Not every place on the planet is warming, but as you can see, most places on the planet are warming, and some are warming more than others. And this, show, this is from 1900 to 2011. And the climate of the last 30 to 40 years has been remarkable. We've seen an increase in the frequency and the intensity of extreme weather events. Heat waves in Western and Central Europe in 2003 were responsible for the about 70,000 deaths. In Eastern Europe and Russia in 2010, 55,000 deaths were attributed to extreme weather, including smoke and fires. We've seen that uh, some of the that hurricanes are somewhat more intense today. It's not as clear that we're experiencing more hurricanes, but the hurricanes we have have a lot more energy. And a lot of flooding in Australia, Pakistan, and Europe recently. And the, I want to introduce the term IPCC. This is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I'll come back and talk about that a little bit more. But the extreme weather that we're seeing, and the, these are weather events, the extreme weather that we, we see, are, uh, events that we see are predicted by the suite of roughly 20 climate models that are used by Intergovernmental Panel um, on Climate Change Scientists. And the projections are that these types of changes will become more frequent. Now this diagram shows you that spatial distribution of, of global temperature but for successive decades, starting in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, 
2001 to 2010, and then the last three years. And what you see is that every successive decade or 10-year interval is warmer than the previous decade. And the other thing you should notice is that how strong the warming is in the high northern latitudes, in the Arctic region. And the Arctic is experiencing these large and fast changes. This shows the decline in the summer, in the extent of summer sea ice in the Arctic. And yes, there's variability in each year up and down, but I think you can clearly see the trend. And in 2012, we reached a minimum that was 12% lower than the prior minimum. And changes like this have a tremendous impact on the Earth's climate system. Notice that this is highly reflective, this is sea ice. The yellow line that you may or may not be able to see shows the 30-year average extent of sea ice at the end of summer. And what's happening is we're taking a white surface that reflects most of the radiation that falls on it and turning it into a dark surface that absorbs most of the radiation. So this is what is called a feedback effect. There are many changes underway. In the northern hemisphere, spring snow cover is declining. And of course, this has impacts on the recharge of soil moisture, and then that affects summertime agriculture. The upper ocean is increasing its heat content. And, un, and in concert with that, we have a cumulative decrease in global glacier ice. And Lonnie is going to talk much more and show you examples of what's happening to the glaciers on the planet. And of course, with the ocean taking up more heat energy and the land and the ice that's on the land melting, we have the ocean expanding from the heat and, the, and of course, then sea level rises and we're taking water on land that's frozen, putting it into the oceans, and so sea level is rising. And we can see that here in the early part of the 20th century, sea level was rising about one millimeter a year. In the middle of the century, it was rising about two millimeters a year. And now, with our best satellite observations, we know that it's rising about 3.3 millimeters a year. So global sea level is accelerating. Now, we're humans, and we tend to forget that the impacts are global because we tend to think locally. And I just want to give you an example of this. And, and the point here is to help you, to remind you that it's important to distinguish climate, which is the 30-year average of temperature and precipitation, from weather, which is what's happening today, next week, or next month. They're quite different. So this shows the spatial distribution of the warming in the winter of 2010. And you notice that the United, you see the, here's the U.S., and you see how cold that winter was across the entire U.S. But down here in the Antarctic Peninsula, let's just use that as an example, you can see it's warm. And in fact, over this period, I was in Antarctica drilling an ice core here on the Bruce Plateau. Lonnie was here in Columbus, Ohio, taking care of our three dogs. And I would call him on the satellite phone, and most times it was actually colder in Columbus than it was where I was drilling ice cores in Antarctica. But that's weather. That's just the difference you know, you could look at another, another winter and it would be much warmer. What's interesting is while we're all here in the U.S. freezing to death, or I wasn't, but he was, it was the second war warmest winter since record keeping began. So we can't judge whether it's a cold winter or a warm winter globally by what we see locally. And we have to make that distinction. 2012 was the warmest year on record for the continental United States. The temperatures were over three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century average. And you can see here the warmest year, how much warmer that was than the, pre, than the prior four warm years. And of these five warm year, warmest years in the U.S., um, 
Only one, 1934, which is, was in the middle of the Dust Bowl era, all of the other four occur after 1998. Whereas the five coldest uh, years in the U.S. all occur before 1924. The thing we need to remember when looking at, at this is that the United States only covers 4.5% of the globe. And we're talking about global climate change. It's a global problem. We're talking about global impacts. We're not talking about just the U.S. or Ohio or Charleston, West Virginia. So climate and weather are quite different, and I like this. This, this is really nice. It's, a, it was, it's an animation, but I decided not to do the animation because I always fear it won't work. And so what we have up here is this man is walking his dog, and here's his dog, and it's on the leash. Now, the man knows where he's going. He's going from point A to point B. You know, he might be going to the grocery store to get something. But he knows what his path is. But the dog walks like this. You know, he sniffs at the fire hydrant over here. And somebody threw out a McDonald's wrapper. And he's, you know, the dog is doing this. And, but the man just plods along. So we can think of the, do the man as the... Uh, the dog walker is like the climate, slow and steady, and it's going in a certain direction, and it's hard to change that direction. But the dog is the climate. It's all over the place. And so Mark Twain once said that climate, that weather, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Remember, climate is the 30-year average, and weather is what you have today or next week. So just thinking about our past January in Charleston, what you were probably expecting was the 30-year mean. You were expecting the January average temperature to be about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. That's your climate. But what you got was about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, seven degrees colder than what you expected. So that's the climate, that's what you expect, and that's weather, and that's what you got. So we need to make that distinction. And this past January was the fourth warmest January on record for the world. So although we thought it was cold, globally it was not a cold January at all. And then. I like this graph because it shows that in our future, we likely will have fewer cold days and killing frosts, and we will have more warm days and heat waves. This is, again, the climatology, the 30-year average of the daily temperatures for all the stations in the NASA data set. This is now the green line that you see here is this green line. And these are successive decades compared to the climatology or the 30-year average. And what you see is many more warm days, many more heat waves, fewer cold days, and fewer killing frosts. But that doesn't mean going forward we're not going to have cold days. We're going to have cold days and we're going to have cold months because there's a lot of variability to the Earth's climate system. Now, the U.S. National Climate Assessment is due to come out this spring, and I had the, a look at it in advance. West Virginia is expected to have more days with temperatures above 95 degrees. West Virginia gets folded into the northeast region. This is Maine, and so we're at the southern end of the northeast region. And you can see the, the uh, the western and southwestern part of West Virginia is expected to have 12 to 15 more uh, days with temperatures above 95 degrees. So I got the data for Huntington, West Virginia, because it was available. The 30-year average tells us that Huntington gets between four and five days a year with temperatures over 95. But by 2040, according to the projections, it'll have three times as many days above 95. So this is what we see going into the future with our best climate, with our best scientific understanding of the climate system and our best computer models, which I'll be the first to tell you are not perfect, but they are uh, our only tool for making uh, projections forward. 
So climate is naturally variable, and there are natural mechanisms that force the climate and have forced the climate over the Earth's history. The first and most important is changes in solar output. If the sun is more luminous and is putting out more radiant energy, the Earth will be warmer. And conversely, if it's putting out less, it will be cooler. Also, changes in the amount of volcanic aerosols in the atmosphere. The eruption of Mount Pinatubo in 1991 cooled the planet for two years. But as soon as the aerosols wash out of the atmosphere, the warming is there and takes off again. And then there's internal variability of the coupled uh, ocean atmosphere system, like the El Nino and various monsoon uh, systems, like the Southeast Asian monsoon. Their human factors are now influencing the climate. And the most important of these is the changes in the concentration of greenhouse gases. You can see here, the in, this is the measured part of the record, and I'll talk about this in another slide in a minute. But you see that the concentration of CO2, carbon dioxide, is going up. Also, changes in aerosols and particles. Human activities put aerosols and particles into the atmosphere. So, for example, when we burn coal, if we don't have scrubbers, which fortunately now due to the Clean Air Act we do have, uh, the, sulfate, uh, the sulfur gases that are emitted are converted to sulfate aerosols, and they tend to have a cooling effect on the climate. Conversely, when we burn biomass, Take, uh, take down forests and burn the trees, we produce what's called black carbon, and that has a warming effect on the planet. And then humans change the surface of the planet in tremendous ways. So, for example, here, you can, this is uh, in the Amazon basin, where they have literally just stripped out the Amazon rainforest. And when you change the vegetation, you change the reflectivity of the surface, meaning how it absorbs or reflects heat, uh, radiant energy, and also you change the hydrologic cycle. Um, I want to introduce the concept of the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is natural. This is the natural greenhouse effect. And it keeps the Earth at its current globally average temperature of about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. It's kind of called the Goldilocks effect. The Earth is the perfect planet for life. It's not too hot and it's not too cold. And it's kept in that state by these naturally occurring greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And the way it works is the sun, of course, puts out solar energy. It passes through the Earth's atmosphere. It heats the Earth's surface. The surface then radiates energy in radiant form back to, to, uh, to, the, to the atmosphere, but some of this is absorbed by these greenhouse gases, and it is re-emitted in the atmosphere, and it warms the planet more than it would be if you didn't have these gases. Now, this is very well understood. The greenhouse effect is not, not a new concept. It's been, a, it's been known for almost two centuries. Uh, the, uh, initially, uh, Fourier uh, identified the fact that we must have some gases in the atmosphere that we can't see, and they, are, they seem to be absorbing radiation. And then Tyndall and Arrhenius took that and advanced that thinking over the next century. But what we're talking about today is the enhanced greenhouse effect. And that is the additional carbon dioxide and methane above the natural abundance that actually reduces the amount of heat energy lost to space. And that means more of it is retained within the Earth atmosphere system. And it's just like a bathtub. If you have more energy in than goes out, it's out of balance and the system will warm. We know what the climate responses are to the different forcing mechanisms. In this panel, we have the well-mixed greenhouse gases. They tend to, let me explain the diagram. This is the Earth's surface, North Pole, South Pole, and elevation in the atmosphere. So well-mixed greenhouse gases tend to warm the lower atmosphere and cool the stratosphere. Sulfate aerosols, regardless of whether they come from uh, burning of coal, or if they come from volcanoes, 
tend to cool the lower atmosphere and warm the stratosphere. Volcanic aerosols occur the same, uh, give the same response, and this is the response to changes in solar output. When the radiant energy from the sun increases, both the stratosphere and the troposphere warm. The, the whole thickness of the atmosphere warms. And if the sun gives out less energy, it cools. And when we put all these factors together, we get this response. That is a warming in the troposphere, or in the lower atmosphere, and a cooling in the upper atmosphere. And now since about 1959, we've been able to make measurements of the of the temperature of the lower stratosphere. And you can see that the stratosphere is cooling. These little blips are volcanic eruptions. Remember we said when we get a volcanic eruption, the upper atmosphere warms and the lower atmosphere cools. And here's the tropospheric warming trend. So this response, that is, with the stratosphere cooling, the upper atmosphere cooling, the lower atmosphere warming, is the response expected from greenhouse gas forcing. And it's predicted by all of our climate models. And the thing to notice is that this response is not forced by the sun. In fact, you will hear uh, discussions in the public that, oh, it's all the sun. It's not the sun at all in terms of the recent warming. This are satellite measurements of the output of the sun of the sun since 1975. And this is the 11-year sunspot cycle. Notice that our last sunspot cycle, the, the minimum was unusually low, and it was unusually long. And I, and I may come back to that in the question and answer. So you might just uh, have that, think about that, or, or remember that. So. One thing that's going on with our planet is the increase in the carbon dioxide. These are the measurements from Mauna Loa in Hawaii since 1958. You can see that in 2013, we actually reached an abundance of 400 parts per million by volume. But that's not a very long record. But we can go to the ice cores measure the concentration of CO2 in these bubbles. Uh, those up front can probably see these bubbles. You can extract that air, measure the chemistry of the air, and what you're seeing here is an 800,000 year record from an ice core in East Antarctica. And the red is the temperature record, and the blue is the carbon dioxide record. And so 800,000 years, almost a one million year record, and what you notice is that when carbon dioxide is high, the Earth is warm. And when the Earth is cool, carbon dioxide is low. The other thing to notice is that over this time, the CO2 does not rise above 300 parts per million, but we're at 400 parts per million today. So we, can, we have to look back about 3 million years in Earth history to a time when carbon dioxide was 400 parts per million, and there were not 7 billion people on the planet uh, at, at, during any of this time, except you know in the last uh, 50 years. And then we look at what the emissions, the, IP, the Intergovernmental Panel uh, greenhouse gas emissions scenarios tell us that under what we call a business as usual scenario, which means with emissions continuing as they are now, we can expect CO2 to be in the range of 900 to 1100 parts per million. But the thing we have to remember about this is that carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for decades to millennia. And this is the graph coming up that you know, keeps climate scientists up at night because what it shows is the removal of uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and what a slow process that is. So here at time zero, if we emit 100 units, it's in a, 100 years from the time of emission, we still have 33% of that CO2 in the atmosphere, and 20% of the CO2 is still with us 1,000 years from now. So this is not an issue of you can just turn a crank not emit any more CO2. That's not even physic 
physically or chemically possible, but if you could do that, we're, the Earth is still going to warm, and the Earth has about, um, a, about a half a degree of warming still in the system if we could uh, not emit any more CO2. So energy consumption on our planet is growing, we know that. The lights that you see show the electricity being used on the planet. You'll notice that Africa is virtually a dark continent in terms of electricity. And 65% of the electricity is powered by fossil fuels. But looking forward, we can see that the, there's uh, expected to be sustained growth in global demand for electricity. I'll t go back today and 2030. So the demand for electricity is forecast to, to more than double. And that's, uh, you know, not just, what, uh, 16 years from now. All right. So we want to have more electricity. We have many people in poverty. They need to be lifted out of poverty. And you can only do that when you have affordable, reliable energy. So my last slide, and I'll put Lonnie up here, I wanted to just go back and introduce again that Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that began, it, it's operated and or it's run by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program. And they've been assessing climate change since 1988. And the fifth assessment was just completed last fall, and the, the summary for policymakers was just published. And it's a, that was a six-year effort led by 209 lead authors representing 39 countries. There were 50 review editors, 600 contributing authors from 32 countries. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you the two primary conclusions from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I want you to remember that every word on that slide had to be approved word for word by 113 governments. And you can think if, how difficult we, it is here in the U.S. to get anybody to agree on anything. But we had 113 governments who stated and agreed that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And since the 1950s, many of the observed changes are unprecedented over decades to millennia. And that the human influence has been detected in the warming of the atmosphere in the ocean, in the changes of the global water cycle, in the reduction of snow and ice, in the rise of mean sea level, and changes in some of the climate extremes. This evidence for hum the human influence has grown since the fourth assessment, and it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. And for the scientists, extremely likely means a 95% confidence in making that statement. So I'll let you think about that while Lonnie makes his way up here. And I wanted to add that some of you may have gotten this when you walked in, and there's, this, there's an abundance of information on this sheet that you can use to continue to learn more about this topic. My pleasure to have an opportunity to speak to you this evening. Can, can you hear me? We're on. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why you can't hear me. There you go. All right, thank you. Okay, we're good now? <laughs> All right, good. All right, I, I want to talk about glaciers and people. And uh, this is something we've spent uh, 40 years working on. And glaciers serve as recorders of climate change because they have layers in them, and we can look back in the past and put the 21st century into perspective. But they also are indicators of climate change. Gets cold, they advance. Gets warm, they retreat. Uh, and I'm going to give you some evidence that the rate of ice loss is accelerating around the world. And in some places, the glaciers are smaller than they have been in over 6,000 years. 
And then I want to talk about another area that I'm interested in, and that is human beings. And I've been working with behavior analysts for the last six years. And if you think climate is complex, when it comes to human beings, this is something. And one of their founders was B.F. Skinner. And he was very optimistic when he was young and when he was middle-aged. But by the time he got to be 80, he was, became pessimistic about human beings and us doing what's in our own best interest. And there are two things that he believed that would also apply to climate change. I mean, immediate consequences outweigh delayed consequences when you're talking about us. And, and when we talk about climate change, we talk about maybe 50 years or 100 years. Well, we don't think in that time frame. And then the other is consequences for the individual outweigh consequences for others. If sea level rises and the people in Bangladesh get flooded out, that, that's unfortunate, but it's not us. It's when us becomes part of the equation that humans get interested. And then I want to talk a little bit about, about our options and what I see as our greatest challenges in the 21st century. We're very fortunate to live on a planet that has many recorders of our past so that we can see how the system has worked. And of course, we're going to talk about just one of these, ice cores. And I'm going to take you out and show you a couple of these places. Uh, but there are distributed around the world, and certainly most of the ice on the planet is in Antarctica and Greenland. One well, of the high mountain ranges around the world, we have glaciers and we have histories from the past. And uh, in order to analyze these, you have to have uh, laboratories, class 100 clean rooms, and where we measure dust and chemistry in the cores. Uh, we have mass spectrometers to measure isotopes, which tell us the temperatures of the past. We have these storage facilities, over 7,000 meters of core, stored at minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit, the only tropical collection on Earth, which becomes more valuable every week as glaciers disappear in other parts of the world. And we also uh, design uh, and build the drills to recover these cores above 20,000 feet. So it takes a whole group of people. We have to have a team, and not only here, but in the 16 countries where we have drilled ice cores. So it's really a major uh, effort. So these are the places that we have drilled. All those dots that you see are our group at Ohio State over the last 40 years. So we have a, a global uh, compilation of records from ice cores. And I'm going to take you to the largest tropical ice cap on Earth. It's 18,500 feet. So it's right above the Amazon. Uh, in uh, the Peruvian Andes. And if you make your way up to the, the uh, summit of this core, you'll, uh, you'll find uh, this glacier, you'll find crevasses because ice moves. And if you look down in these crevasses, you can see these layers. Because there's a very distinct wet and dry season, every dry season you get a dust layer. If you go down in the crevasse, you can see how uniform those layers are. And you can see if you took a drill and you drilled through that, how you could get that history. And that's exactly what we do uh, from these glaciers. Uh, and the first time we drilled here was in 1983. Uh, we built the first solar-powered uh, ice core drill. We tested it on a parking garage at Ohio State University, drilled through some blocks of ice, seen the work, and we took it to the Andes and recovered two cores to bedrock. Uh, back at that time, uh, we did not have the technology to keep the ice frozen uh, because it was a two-day journey from the end of the nearest road. Uh, so we went back 20 years later, in 2003, where we had developed that technology and brought back uh, frozen ice core. Uh, and when we get them back to the lab, we analyze them, and we analyze them for many different things. This is just a couple. These are the isotopes. This is our temperature proxy. These are the annual dust layers, and this is a period from 1805 up to about 1825. So every year you get a dust layer. So you count these back just like you would a tree. And only this tree goes back 1,800 years. So you can get a longer term history. So if you look at the temperature records, these are the isotopes. This is the last 1,000 years. These are decadal averages. Uh, you can see this is a warm period coming up to about 1,500. This is the Little Ice Age. And then you can see the warming in the 20th century. Uh, this is from the 1983 core that came back as water samples. These are ice cores from 20 years later. So you can see the warming has continued. And if you measure the thickness of those layers, you can calculate how precipitation has changed over the last 1,000 years. Browns are lower precipitation. These are higher precipitation periods. Low in the 20th century is above average. So you can get a very longer time perspective of changes on the planet. Uh, 
we also do this over in the Himalaya. This is the Dasupu. This is 23,500 feet. And there you get a history of the monsoons coming out of India. And if you look at that record, you'll see very similar variations. These are isotopes each year. This is the last 100 years. Dust has an annual record. Nitrates, which comes from plants, have an annual record. And you get this long-term history. So you can put together a big picture of what's happening uh, in these areas. And if you do that, you take all these records, three from the Andes of South America and four from over in Tibet, and you look at the last 2,000 years. These are Cato averages of since the birth of Christ coming forward in time. You can see the medieval warm period here, little ice age here, and then you can see the warming in the 20th century. And if you look at temperature reconstructions from trees and historical records in the northern hemisphere, you see a very similar record. And the red curve here is the instrumental record. And when you look at that, what stands out is how unusual the last 50 years are. Now, you can show this at the U.S. Senate to a senator, and his eyes will kind of glaze over, because they have no idea what an isotope is. So, uh, glaciers also record climate in another way. And if you uh, uh, you look at them, and I, I like this quote. This is from Henry Pollock's book, uh, A World Without Ice. It says, ice asks no questions, presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates. It's not burdened by any ideology. It carries no political baggage. As it changes from a solid to a liquid, it just melts. <laughs> so I think that's very important. So when, if uh, you look when I went as a graduate student to Kelkaya Ice Cap, I took this photo. Uh, you can see the annual layers on this cliff, uh, and you can see how you could get that history. That's in 1977. This is the same place in 2002. And you can see how the records are being lost. And for the people who live there, a very valuable water resource is being lost. So people are already being impacted uh, in these areas. If you look at uh, the Kelkaya ice cap from space, this is a Landsat image. Cori Kalis Glacier is in here. This is Cordillera Vilconota. This is an image from 1988. If you look 18 years later of this same place, you can see how the ice decreases. And here you can actually see in yellow how much ice has been lost. In the Cordillera Vilconota, we've lost 24 percent of the area that was covered 18 years earlier. You can get an idea of the scale of these changes that are taking place. Uh, this is uh, the Cori Kalis Glacier. This is what it looked like when I first saw it and set up a survey line. This is 1978, and this is going to fade into 2011. So you can see the changes that have happened in this valley. And you'll see how the ice moves up to higher elevations uh, over that period of time. So you can see the lake that formed. And you see how the ice is moving up. The lake started forming in 1991. And all around this ice cap, the ice is retreating. This is 1977. You see people here. This is now a lake in here. And in 2002, at the back side of this lake, you see a person for scale. This cliff is 100 feet high. And it's retreating. And right at the base, we found a wetland plant. It has no woody tissue, perfectly preserved. So we were able to collect it and identify it and date it, carbon-14 date. And it was 5,200 years old. That means this ice cap has not been smaller for 5,200 years. Otherwise, this plant would have decayed. And you can see the plant here and the ice wall right behind it. This is 2002. Three years later, same place, here's the plant. You see where the wall is. And we've continued to collect plants. We have over 60 of them now, and they've been carbon dated. And we had a paper in Science uh, uh, last year where we showed that all the plants we collected on this side of this lake date 4,700 years in age. In 2011, this land was exposed on this side of the lake. All those plants date 6,300 years in age. And that tells us a lot. It tells us that it, uh, if you go back 6,000 years ago, it took 1,600 years for the glacier to move from here to capture the plants here. It's taken 25 years for it to go from here to here. So these changes are very rapid. 
And they're happening everywhere. Uh, probably a lot of you have been up to Alaska. If you've been in a Brooks Range, 100% of the glaciers in Brooks Range are retreating today. Southeast Alaska, this is the Muir Glacier in 1941. This is what it looked like in 2004. 98% of the glaciers in Southeast Alaska are retreating in today's world. If you go to the Himalayas, very hard to find old pictures in that part of the world. Here's one from the Royal Geographical Society in 1921. Same place in 2009. And you can look at the peaks here. See, they're the same peaks. And you can see how much ice has been lost out of that valley. 95% of the glaciers studied in this area are retreating in today's world. If you go to the uh, Alps, uh, we have older pictures there. This is 1903, and this is going to fade into 2005. And you can see where the glaciers are uh, today. 99% of the glaciers in the Alps are retreating in today's world. Uh, we have a big program in, in Tibet. Uh, these are places we've drilled. It's called the Third Pole Program, and we're looking over this whole area with our uh, Chinese and German colleagues. Uh, uh, this is one of the largest glacial stores of fresh water. There are over 46,000 glaciers. It's referred to as Asia's water tower. This is geopolitically a very important area to us because the rivers, like the Indus River, actually flow through three nuclear power countries, China, Pakistan, and India, which don't get along well in, in today's world. So uh, if you look where the major glaciers originate, or, or the rivers originate, you can see they start with glaciers up here in the highlands. And the water helps sustain about 1.5 billion people in 10 different countries in that part of the world. I'm going to take you to one of these, Nanunami, just to give you an idea of what the glaciers look like in that part of the world. This is what the mountain looks like. And if you make your way up through these uh, uh, canyons, up to the top, and we take six tons of equipment up there, uh, this is the top of the mountain. And you can see a person here, and you, you might be able to see the drill camp out there. So in 2006, we drilled a three cores to bedrock. But to give you an idea how you get them out of here, helicopters will not operate up above 20,000 feet. So you can't use helicopters. So we have to use, initially, Sherpas that we hire, uh, and porters uh, to carry these cores. So there's a meter of frozen ice core in each of these. When you get to the edge of the glacier, you're still 4,000 feet from where the vehicles are out on the plateau. So in that part of the world, you've got to use what's available. So we use these yaks. Uh, these are insulated core boxes. Uh, and we have six meters of core in each of those boxes, 12 meters to a yak. We drill five to 600 meters of core. So you can get an idea that we need a whole herd of yaks that carry these down to the trucks. We get to the trucks, we make a dash across the Tibetan Plateau to Lhasa. It's air car cargoed to Beijing, where we go through Chinese customs. Then we go to Chicago, we put it on a, uh, a freezer truck, and we truck it down to Columbus, Ohio, where it's analyzed. So it, there's a long process, and it usually takes a month to get the cores back, and you don't know whether you succeeded until you get back. But the first thing we do is measure radioactivity. All the thermonuclear bomb tests that we've put off in the, in the atmosphere have left a radioactive layer on all the glaciers of the world. And if you drill down, you can measure this. This is a 62, 63 Soviet uh, uh, test. It shows up on all the previous cores that we drilled in Tibet, but not in the most recent one. It's not there. Then we look for an Ivy test, which was a US test at sea level that produced chlorine 36. And you see it around the world but you don't see it on Anunnaki. And the reason you don't see it is the glacier is losing mass from the surface down. It's no longer accumulating above 20,000 feet. And this has tremendous impacts on uh, water resources going in the future. And since this paper was published, there have been uh, two other glaciers identified where these have disappeared. So it's not just one glacier. Uh, another place we've worked is Kilimanjaro in Africa. This is the oldest photo we could find. These are glaciers coming forward in time to 2006. We drilled there in 2000. And we continue to take aerial photographs of, this, uh, of these ice bodies, and we map them. So the most recent was in January of 2013. So since uh, 1912, 88.3% of the ice on that mountain has disappeared. And since 2000, 40% that was there when we drilled is now gone. Uh, these changes are remarkable. 
Uh, this is the Shirtwanger Glacier as it appeared in 2000. We drilled all the way to the bedrock. We put a stake all the way down. Stake was 32 feet high. And that stake has been measured since we left it. Uh, uh, and this shows how the surface lowered till 2013. You couldn't, uh, uh, it's all gone at this site. The ice has disappeared. So not only are they shrinking, but they're losing mass from the surface down. Uh, this is what Fjordwanger looked like in 2013. This was a solid ice mass back in 2000. And what happens when they break up is you uh, expose this darker surface. And as Ellen was saying, you absorb more radiation, warms the temperature, and you speed up the process. The last place I want to take you is New Guinea. Most people don't know there's a glacier in the middle of this tropical rainforest in New Guinea. Very difficult place to get to. Uh, this is its location. And the oldest photo we could find in that area was 1936. And you see the ice here is 1991 and 2001. And we drilled there in, uh, in 2010. Here's the uh, satellite images, Landsat 1989. Blues are the glaciers. This is 20 years later. And you see many, many of these glaciers have disappeared over that 20-year uh, period. Uh, it is the only glacier we have ever drilled where it rained every day on the glacier. My tent sat here for two weeks. The surface lowered. The tent protected it, the ice underneath it, and, this, uh, and the surface lowered 30 centimeters. And if you calculate that out for a year, that's seven meters. And uh, the whole ice field is only 32 meters thick. So you can calculate out that that's less than five years uh, if, uh, if that rate continues, and that glacier will be gone. So if you look at Kilimanjaro in Africa or over in New Guinea, you can see uh, the area of ice on these mountains from uh, 1920 coming forward. And you can project these out into the future and see they're only going to be there for the next decade or so. And they'll be gone. And the history will be gone with them. So if you look around the world in the 20th and 21st century, these red areas are all the places where we're losing ice on land. Now you can be very conservative and say, what if we lost 8%? I mean, I've showed you places that, since I was a graduate student, we've lost 25% of the area. But what if we lost 8% of the ice now on land? Here is our Gulf Coast. So uh, New Orleans, Miami down here, lose 8% of the ice on land. This is what it looked like. So these can have tremendous, if you look around the world, you know, a lot of big cities are on coastlines because they were established when we had sailing ships. So we have a lot of infrastructure uh, at risk from this. So how to manage a world with threats from climate change, rising sea level, and rising energy consumption. I think this is our big challenge in the 21st century. And we can argue from what Ellen was saying that there's a perfect storm brewing, and that is from the fact that CO2's lifetime is over a th thousand years. Climate system has an inertia. We will not see the impact of today's CO2 levels for another 20 to 30 years because it takes a long time to warm up ice sheets and to warm up the world's oceans. Uh, there's a positive amplifying feedback. You lose the ice, you lose the reflectivity of the Earth. We absorb more energy. Uh, and we have a fossil fuel addiction around the world. Uh, we can talk about an alternative future, uh, more renewable energies, cleaner air and water, enhanced economic development, and better jobs. And I know I grew up in West Virginia. I went to Ohio State to study cold geology. But I know the, the maximum number of people employed in the coal industry was in 1924 in West Virginia. In the U.S., we now have less than 50 people working in mines. Uh, we have over 100,000 people now working in the solar industry in this country. The change is coming, and we, we need to prepare uh, for that future. Now, the thing that gets our attention is what's happening in our backyard. So I'm from Ohio now. And 2011 was the wettest year ever recorded in Ohio. So we had floods, that cost money. It cost insurance money, it cost people money. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, other parts of the world, like Ellen mentions, Pakistan in 2011, floods there. And there are insurance companies like Munich Re and Swiss Re that insure insurance companies around the world. And they keep track of this. So in 2011, there was an overall loss of 148 billion due to weather-related events, and of which 55 billion was covered by insurance. The rest was picked up by governments, taxpayers, and 
uh, individuals. If you look at uh, Sandy, uh, there was $60 billion worth of damage done in New York and New Jersey. And things that we don't often think about, that within a half a mile of the coast in New York and New Jersey, there are 45 Superfund sites. So as that sea level rises and you get storm surges coming in, these things suddenly become at risk for the people who live in these areas. Fires, you see this on television. And it's amazing when you look at the most acreages burnt in the US, that this is 2006, 2007, 2012. So these have tremendous uh, impacts on many, many people. Uh, floods, uh, this is out in Colorado this uh, past year. Uh, there was, uh, this was considered a thousand year flood. Uh, the, it cost almost uh, $2 billion, but people were not insured because it doesn't flood in Colorado. And so this brings home one of these human traits, consequences for individuals outweigh consequences for others. When it's your house that goes in the river, then you become really concerned about this. This is something you spent your life building and, and saving for. So you become concerned about that. And then these storms, you see super, super sandy, super typhoons. I mean, these are a lot of energy in the system. So this is in the Philippines at the, uh, in November of 2013. Then of course we had the snowstorms. Uh, this is in Atlanta, uh, this uh, uh, past January. But at the same time, when it was snowing in Atlanta, if you went to Australia, uh, there were record temperatures there. there. This is a temperature in Birdsville, Australia, 119.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So when winter comes here, summer comes in the southern hemisphere. So you've got to look at the whole planet, as Ellen was saying. Then the floods in, in London and Europe uh, this winter. Um, the winter of 2014 is the wettest on record uh, since records began by the UK Met Office. Uh, in 1910. So these are what the events that get our attention. And this is the magnitude of these storms when they're coming in off of the Atlantic Ocean. Tremendous amount of power associated with them. Now, if you're in the insurance business, this becomes even more interesting because here are the number of weather uh, catastrophes worldwide from 1980 to 2012. And you can see how this line is occurring, uh, increasing. And we're looking at storms and floods, and we're looking at fires and droughts, and, and the loss associated with those. So if you look at the uh, this same period and you look at the losses, uh, well, let me say that this is another part of the uh, when you get to human behavior, immediate consequences outweigh delayed consequences. When it starts costing money, people get excited about that. And so if you look at the insurance business, um, over the last 10 years, weather-related losses average about $184 billion a year, of which $56 billion is covered by insurance. So these are, these are big costs if you're in, in this industry. So uh, I think we have three options when we look at our future. One is we can talk about mitigation, which means taking measures to reduce the price or the pace and the magnitude of these changes in global climate that is caused by human activities. And examples of mitigation include reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases, enhancing the sinks, taking it out of the air. We can talk about geoengineering to counteract the effects of warming of greenhouse gases. I mean, these are our options. We can talk about adaptation, which means taking measures to reduce the adverse impacts on human well being that results from climate changes that do occur. And examples of adaptation, changing agriculture practices, strengthening defenses against climate-related diseases, building more dams and dikes. But this is moving target, and we're not very good yet with our models producing, uh, uh, estimating what the regional impacts of these changes uh, will be. And finally, suffering. And that is the adverse impacts that are not avoided by mitigation or adaptation. And I think that's the three options we have on the table. Now, there is a huge opportunity here. And uh, these are investments uh, to address global climate change. And they include, and these are already underway, conservation, increased efficiency, uh, the way we use energy, uh, the uh, increasing uh, popularity of four-cylinder cars and hybrids, uh, electric cars. Uh, we can look at energy sources, uh, renewable energy, fuel cells. We can talk about zero emission coal-burning power plants. 
Uh, we, can, we can look at solar, uh, of both photovoltaic cells as well as passive solar. Geothermal, uh, recovered energy uh, power plants, ethanol, wind power. Uh, we have uh, mass transit, light rails, way to move people. So you get engineers, we need architects, I mean, uh, to, to, to make these changes. Housing designs toward more compact cities. Nanotechnology, LED technology. I mean, these are future growth industries uh, for this country. And, but all of these don't mean anything unless you do something. And I wanna just show you what we're doing at Ohio State. Uh, we're one of the biggest campuses of, uh, in the US. We have 70 plus student organizations that focus on sustainability on campus. We're number three on the US EPA's list for the 20 largest universities using green power. 25% of electricity on campus is coming from wind. We just put in a geothermal uh, energy field to heat our dorms and cool our dorms. Uh, in uh, 2012, 98.2% .2 of the waste generated in the Ohio Stadium during football games, which is very big at Ohio State, uh, was uh, recycled. Uh, we spent 7.1 million in energy efficiency and conservative infrastructure to upgrade buildings that are already on campus. Uh, this is all in, in uh, 2012. We have 37 uh, alternative energy powered buses on campus. Uh, we have a goal that uh, to divert 90% of the materials generated on campus from landfills by 2030. Uh, we have seven charging stations now for electric vehicles and we planted 916 trees on campus. So these are things uh, that, uh, and this is where people need to get involved. And uh, I wanna mention a couple of these. I know there's gonna be a, a environmental council meeting here uh, in Charleston uh, where people are looking at climate solutions. Uh, we need to get involved in those. And, and there's uh, others, uh, I just was handed this. Uh, there's the West Virginia Allegheny Highlands Climate Change Impacts Initiative. It'll be on June the 7th, uh, in, on 2014, up at Blackwater Falls. So, so there's an interest growing uh, in this region, and we need to uh, 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 really identify with that and start to bring about changes. So, but I want to close on a personal note. Um, I've been uh, running expeditions around the world, and in 2011, I went to this site in the Alps where we drilled four cores uh, to bedrock. But I got there, and, and one day I could not get from my tent up to uh, the drill site. I could not breathe. And I just made it back to Ohio State to the Ross Heart Hospital, where I ended up on a heart pump. And then I got an LVAD, a left ventricle assist device, uh, that uh, they put in my old heart, which is essentially a turbine. And you have a drive line, and uh, you run on batteries during the day, and you plug in an outlet at night. Now, there's, uh, that device was invented six years ago, and, and, and it was my bridge toward uh, getting a heart transplant. And uh, here uh, we are up at uh, Philadelphia uh, in April of 2012, uh, getting the Benjamin Franklin Medal of Science. Uh, that's Ellen, that's me. You'll see I'm running on a computer that's driving that device that's in me. Uh, we got back from this, and three days later, I was in the Ross Heart Hospital where they found a match for me, and I got a new heart. Two weeks later, I was out of the hospital, and one year later, I led an expedition to the Zangsler Glacier at 20,500 feet. Now, now, the reason I tell you this story is that I think I understand climate deniers much better. Because when my cardiologist told me that uh, when this was diagnosed, he said I was on a plateau. And I would hit a threshold and I would fall maybe to another plateau. But out here in my future, I had only one option, and that was a heart transplant. Well, 20 years ago, I had been diagnosed with uh, exercise-induced asthma. And the beauty of that is there's a drug for it, which meant I could do climb these mountains and do what I do. If you say you have cardiac, uh, you, you have a, a congestive heart failure, they're never gonna let you go to any mountain. So, so I fought him uh, and uh, through a defibrillator and continued to run expeditions until 
the obvious became obvious to me. And, uh, and the point here is that it really doesn't matter what we think. It only matters what is. And when it comes to climate change, at the end of the day, it's only what is that we need to be concerned about. So let me end with this. Our greatest challenges in the 21st century, I believe, are learning how to get along with each other. This has been with us for some time, and you can debate how well we do that. Uh, but there's a second one, which is learning how to get along with our planet so that we can stay in the life that we all know and enjoy uh, on, this, on this planet. These two challenges deal with human behavior and are therefore very closely related. So if you uh, look at our planet from space, and if anything we've learned from our international space program is how unique this planet is for the life as we know it. And when we talk about global climate change, nature is a timekeeper here. And none, none of us are wise enough to see how much time we have to make the changes that we need to make. But we do know that the clock is ticking. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and turn it back over to our organizers. So thank you very much.